The New York Rangers make too many mistakes in a 5-1 to one home loss to the Buffalo Sabres. Plus, Capo Caco sustains an injury, and Patrick Kane signs with the Red Wings. All this and more on today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers. You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 950 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. Just want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for $20 off of your first purchase. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day. So Rangers play the Sabres last night in Madison Square Garden and uh, just some uncharacteristically sloppy play from the Rangers. Too many turnovers, uh, certainly a much slower start than we've uh, gotten used to seeing them uh, enjoy, you know, this season. They One of their staples has been getting off to fast starts in games and playing with urgency right from the opening faceoff. We didn't really see a whole lot of that. Part of this might be uh, due to the wear and tear of the schedule. It's a very dense schedule, very challenging portion of the schedule for the Rangers. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, but I do want to kind of kick off today's episode by talking about what turned out to be sort of the, the biggest news coming out of that game and the headline grabber. I mean, look, the Rangers didn't play well. We know that. Um, I would say after the early loss to the Predators, I would put this as probably their second weakest performance of the season. And obviously they've been winning a lot of games, but this is probably uh, overall their, their second weakest performance, I would say. Um, but again, the, the headline grabber, we can live with all that. It's an off night. It happens once in a while. Um, it is what it is. And the Sabres were obviously opportunistic and uh, capitalized on the Ranger mistakes. But the thing that's kind of going to linger a little bit or, or could linger is the fact that Capo Caco is now injured. He was hurt during the second period. And then at the start of the third period on the broadcast, that's when uh, Sam Rosen let all of us know that uh, apparently he had gotten word that Capo Caco had indeed sustained a lower body injury and would not return for that game. And and based on how he hit the boards and, and just the way that looked, uh, that was not exactly surprising news, but uh, he was ruled out at that point. After the game was over, Peter Laviolette was pretty vague about the injury to Caco. Uh, he basically just said that Caco was being evaluated for a lower body injury. And that was just about it. And to be fair, um, that might have been about all that Peter Laviolette even knew about the situation at the time. Obviously, the game had just wrapped up. And, um, you know, I'm sure he was still being diagnosed uh, at that time. But as far as what happened on the play, uh, Kako, you know, all of a sudden, this kind of happened off camera. Uh, or it might have been like in the corner of the camera. But I didn't happen to be looking that way uh, when it happened live. But all of a sudden, you know, Kako is down behind the Sabres net. You know, he's rolling around on the ice and grabbing his leg. Uh, he was then helped off the ice during a uh, TV commercial break and was not putting any weight on his left leg. Uh, he was basically what happened. He was tangled up with Johnson behind the Buffalo net and his leg just kind of got caught behind him. His skate kind of dug into the boards there and his leg essentially just bent in a way that your leg really is not supposed to bend. Um, you know, as he was going off the ice, he couldn't put any weight on it. Uh, he had one of the trainers there and, one of his teammates, I think it was Trocek. It was difficult to tell from the camera angle, but I think it was Trocek uh, helping him off the ice there. But he's getting some stick taps from his teammates, and obviously everybody looked concerned. Um, and again, let me also just say that like this was not a dirty play or anything like that. It was just uh, two players engaged, kind of battling for position there, getting tangled up a little bit, and Kako just fell in uh, about the worst way possible. The, the way that his leg bent behind him was just uh, it's kind of tough to look at, and uh, obviously you feel for Capo Kako. I do want to also address this, too. There was a small amount of Ranger fans who, as soon as this happened, they're saying, oh, man, we can sign Patrick Kane now. Put Kako's going to be out for the year. Put him on LTIR. We'll get that cap space, this, that, and the other thing. First of all, we now know that that's not going to happen because Patrick Kane has indeed signed a deal with the Detroit Red Wings. We will talk more about that a little bit later in today's episode. Um, but more importantly... Can we let Kako get off the ice first? Can we let him kind of hobble his way to the locker room? Can we let a doctor look at him before we all start declaring that he's out for the year and here's how we're going to manipulate the salary cap and Patrick Kane's going to come in and, and do this, that, and the other thing? Like, let him get off the ice. Let a doctor check him out and let, let's wait and see the official word as far as uh, how bad this is going to be. And, and fingers crossed that it's not bad at all. Um, I would think, especially based on a couple of roster moves that the Rangers made, that certainly Kako will not be out there on Wednesday against Detroit. I don't think he's been officially ruled out, but just watching that play, 
um, seeing how he hit the boards and seeing that he could not put any weight on his one leg. Uh, be a pretty miraculous turnaround if he's out there on Wednesday. I guess never say never, but obviously we'll see. And, you know, I feel for Kako here just from, you know, first of all, a human perspective. Uh, yes, Capo Kako is off to a slow start offensively. Um, yeah, he was demoted from the first line to the third line this season when uh, that top line just couldn't get anything going. But he is still a part of this team. He does still play strong defensive hockey. And I really think hockey more than any other sport, you truly need contributions up and down your lineup. Obviously, certain players are going to play bigger roles than others. Certain players are going to do this and, and other players are going to do that. But it truly is the one sport where you can't really hide anybody on your roster. Everybody who dresses every every single night, you're going to be out there for at least a certain amount of time. And uh, you have to make a positive impact while you're out there. And, and that's what it takes for uh, you know, a team to eventually become Stanley Cup champions. You need everybody pulling in the right direction and um, everybody contributing in one way or another. And obviously, the points weren't there. 20 games for Kako, two goals, one assist. Uh, he was still a plus one average 13 minutes and 33 seconds of ice time per night. Um, just hasn't really been getting to those high danger scoring areas. It feels like every time he's got the puck, he's kind of like along the boards. And, um, you know, it's not like it's been a case of a lot of bad luck. You know, maybe once or twice he's been robbed or uh, robbed of an assist in one situation or another. But, yeah, I don't know. It, it just doesn't feel like um, he's kind of been shortchanged as far as how many points he has. Maybe he deserves a couple more than three. But, uh, let's also not act like, you know, he's been a point per game player either. Um, but the thing here too is, you know, it's only a quarter of the way through the season and yeah, Kat goes off to a disappointing start, but obviously there's still a lot of time for him to eventually pick it up. I got to believe he'll eventually do better than, you know, averaging three points every 20 games. If he's able to continue this season, uh, we'll see if he gets that opportunity because as of right now, uh, again, we don't know exactly what the injury is other than a lower body injury. And we also do not know uh, how long he's going to be out. So we'll, Obviously, uh, keep an eye on that, at least of the as of this recording. But the time I post this, they'll probably drop the news and we'll have an idea of, of the severity of the injury. And, you know, that that's kind of just the way it goes. But if that's the case, we'll obviously talk about it in the next episode. And I'm sure the everydayers will be back for that. Um, we do know, though, uh, I saw this right before I hit record here, that the Rangers have made a couple of roster moves. And this would also kind of uh, lead you to believe once again that there's no way Kako is going to be out there on Wednesday. Again, I suppose never say never, but all signs are pointing to him uh, sitting out for that game. The Rangers have called up centers Johnny Brodzinski and Adam Edstrom to the to the NHL roster, and they have reassigned defenseman Connor Mackey to the Hartford Wolfpack. And just to kind of recap who all these players are and everything, Mackey, 27 years old, he's only played NHL games. Um, this is technically going to be the fifth time that the Rangers are sending him down to the Wolfpack. He's been called up and sent down a bunch of times because basically their paper transactions where the Rangers are kind of, um, using a technicality to accrue more cap space heading into the trade deadline this season. Uh, but Mackey, as of now has not suited up for the Rangers. Uh, him being sent down also gives you an idea that Adam Fox very, very likely going to be out there on Wednesday. So that's the good news because you know, if, if Fox comes back, then the Rangers, even without Mackey, would still have seven defensemen. Uh, you'd have the the six that everybody would expect to be in the lineup. And then Zach Jones would be the seventh defenseman and a healthy scratch, presumably. Um, so that's where things stand as far as Mackey goes. This time, you know, they're sending him down to the Wolfpack, but this time I think he's actually going there and he's actually going to uh, play hockey for them. It's not just a, a paper transaction. You've also got Johnny Brodzinski being called up. Everybody knows about Brodzinski by now. The Wolfpack captain, you know, he's been a... NHL, AHL swingman for the Rangers over the last couple of seasons here. Uh, he is lighting it up with the Hartford Wolfpack right now. A team high, 11 goals. Uh, he is second on the team with 14 assists. Leads the team with 25 points in just 18 games. The next closest on the Wolfpack to Brodzinski in terms of points is Alex Belzeal. He has 18. Uh, Brodzinski also a plus eight, third best on the team. And in fact, his 25 points, that leads the entire league. He's got more points than anybody in the AHL. So a very impressive start to the season for Brodzinski. We'll see uh, what kind of role he's looking at with the Rangers. Obviously, uh, can't see him being in the top six. Can't see him cracking the power play units. I mean, maybe the second unit, an outside chance, but I, I probably wouldn't even expect that. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, then you've also got Adam Edstrom. He's six foot seven, 220 pounds, uh, 23 years old, drafted by the Rangers in 2019 in the sixth round. Uh, he went number 161 overall that year. And I would think he'll probably be the healthy scratch and they would go with Brodzinski in the lineup over Edstrom. Uh, that does remain to be seen. Edstrom with the Wolfpack this year, 18 games, tied for second on the team with seven goals, also two assists and a plus six. And if Brodzinski's in for Kako, 
then you've got a couple of options here. You could just put Johnny Brodzinski on the right wing on the third line and have him take Capo Caco's spot. But if you want Brodzinski at center, then he probably centers the fourth line. And you see Barclay Goodrow move from fourth line center to third line right wing. So the Rangers have a couple of options as far as uh, how they want to line up there. Once again, assuming that Capo Caco will not be out there against Detroit. And, you know, again, I don't want to speculate too much until we see uh, what the actual diagnosis is. But if Caco is out for the long term, then yes, uh, it is possible that a trade could happen at some point. But uh, I'm willing to wait and see what the diagnosis is. And obviously all the best to Capo Caco. And you just keep your fingers crossed and hope that uh, the injury was not as bad as it looked like it potentially could have been uh, when it happened last night. But I'm going to keep everything rolling just a second here. I do want to get to this game, uh, basically just kind of lay out the reasons why the Rangers came up short against the Sabres, and we will get to that in just a second here. We're also going to talk about Patrick Kane, by the way, signing with the Red Wings. Uh, first, though, definitely want to let everybody know today's episode of Locked on New York Rangers is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at all the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. Also, definitely want to make sure everybody is aware that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, to go ahead and keep everything rolling here, like I said, want to uh, turn our attention to everything that happened between the Rangers and the Sabres last night. And I kind of alluded to this a little bit in the, the intro of the show, but just an uncharacteristically sloppy performance from the Rangers and uncharacteristically slow start for the Rangers. We've seen them basically hit the ground running. And even in some instances where, you know, maybe the other team gets to jump on them initially, like we saw that against the Penguins uh, in their recent matchup against the Rangers. The Penguins had the better of play for like, Maybe the first four minutes, and then the Rangers took it right away from them just as quickly. That just never really seemed to happen in this game. I mean, it started to toward the end of the second period. The Rangers got it going a little bit. Uh, they started to find their game. They even cut the deficit to two to one. It felt like the game tying goal was on the way. And then, of course, uh, the Sabres scored three times in the last, you know, four or five minutes there, whatever it was. But again, sloppy. Careless with the puck, as much so as we've seen from the Rangers, I would say, this entire season. You look at just the first period, the, the way this game started, you could just tell pretty quickly that the Rangers were just a half step slow, a little bit off, not quite as sharp as they typically are. You had an early giveaway by the Rangers. Uh, Truba passed from Mika from behind the Ranger net, and Mika just missed the puck. You know, I, I don't know what happened here. It seemed like a fairly easy pass to be able to corral, but Mika couldn't do it. He overskated it, and then you get the Sabres getting to the puck, and a quick pass to Skinner alone in front of the net, and a nasty glove save by Igor Shesterkin. This is only about 30 seconds into the game, and it was uh, Igor's first save of the night, so a uh, great save there, picking up his teammates, did Igor Shesterkin. Not too long after this, you had Blake Wheeler in the Rangers zone. He made kind of a dangerous pass from along the boards over to the center of the ice to Eric Gustafson, and Buffalo wasn't really in on the forecheck, but they came pretty close to stealing this puck, uh, intercepting the pass from Wheeler to Gustafson, the pass got there. You know, Wheeler did get it to Gustafson, but now Gustafson's kind of in a tough spot. He's backing away. Um, he's kind of trying to retreat behind the Ranger net and probably, you know, come out the other side. Um, but unfortunately, the Sabres get the puck away from him. They pass in front. Uh, Alex Tuck gets a chance, and Igor makes a point-blank save. And then right after this, uh, Benson is left all alone right in front of the Ranger net, and Igor denies him too. So the Rangers really playing with fire here in the early goings, and then it finally caught up to them. Uh, you got Paterka scoring a goal pretty much out of nowhere in the first period, of, and Buffalo goes up one to nothing at that time. You had, the Rangers had the puck. They had the puck in their own zone. Igor gets it to Gustafson. Gustafson over to Lindgren. Lindgren's in the corner. He tries to pass it up the ice, but it's intercepted by power. Uh, he puts it at the net. 
the shot was blocked by Gustafson, but Paterka's right there. He picks it up, fires at home, and um, that obviously gave Buffalo the lead. And then right after this, I believe it was the shift that followed, uh, you get a one-timer off of a cross-ice pass for Buffalo, and Igor once again having to make a really nice sliding save. So a really sloppy start. And I know we're talking about the first period, but if I could cheat just a little bit here, I also want to throw out the start of the second period because a lot of times this year, the rare occasion where we've seen the Rangers get off to a rough start, or not even that, just have a rough period, they tend to come out you know, pretty hot in the following period. There's been a couple of times this year where maybe the Rangers weren't at their best in the second period, and then they come out flying in the third period, they hit the ground running, and they do whatever they have to do to, to win the game a lot of times. A couple of different instances where you know the Rangers have been maybe tied um, after two periods and didn't play so great in the second period, and then they come out flying in the third period, and they get the job done, and they get two points. But... In this one, that was really nowhere to be found. I was kind of looking for it. You know, okay, bad first period, only down by a goal. You know, we'll, we'll be all right here. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but unfortunately, once again, that did not happen. And there's a play here that just kind of illustrates how the game went for me as far as the Rangers did uh, on this night. And it's not like a play that, like, doomed them or was just atrocious and you just can't believe how bad it was. But there was a situation here, again, early in the second period, and, and you're looking for that fast start to the middle stanza here. And you've got Gustafson. You know, he's skating out of his own zone. He tries to make like a short pass to Trocek in the neutral zone, just kind of lead him up the ice, and he just missed him. He just completely missed a very easy pass, the kind of pass that Gustafson can make in his sleep, and the puck slides all the way down the rink, and it goes all the way down for an icing. Trocek wasn't even able to get his stick on it. And again, this play did not like doom them to a loss, but it was just indicative of the fact that they weren't sharp. It was such an easy pass. And I haven't like audibly reacted in a negative way to the Rangers um, all that much this season, but this one kind of brought it out, out of me. It, it, like the pass missed, and it was just such a simple, easy pass that misfired. And I just went, "Come on, guys! Like, like, let's go! Let's get it together here." Um, again, we're just not used to seeing this kind of play from the Rangers. And you do have to credit the Sabers. You know, I uh, something that I thought that like occurred to me while I was watching this game. This almost felt like the Rangers were playing themselves from like four years ago. Because if you remember, like during the David Quinn era, the Rangers were ridiculously young, just like the Sabers are right now. They had talent, just like the Sabres do right now. And any, any given night, they, they could play very, very well, and they could get just about anybody. They, they could surprise some teams. They could also have nights where they just lay a complete egg and look uh, very much like a very young, very inexperienced team. And we're seeing that from the Sabres. The Sabres have beaten some good teams. Uh, they've lost to some not-so-good teams and kind of a dangerous opponent for the Rangers in this game. I hadn't really thought of that going in, but it kind of came to fruition um, you know, in this in this contest here, because the, the Sabres, again, uh, talented, young, hardworking team, and uh, they got the Rangers in this one, that's for sure. Um, so, yeah, that, that was just one example. And then also in the second period, um, you had a chance where Mika was looking to spring Chris Kreider on a breakaway. And Mika's in the neutral zone, and he passes up to Kreider. And the pass just wasn't really on the money. You know, it um, it was a little bit ahead of Kreider. I thought also, though, that maybe Kreider still could have handled it, even though it wasn't right where probably he was expecting it to. And again, just another one of those little things that show that the Rangers just are not sharp in this game. Um, a silver lining, though, for, for Mika, and I, I guess for Ranger fans everywhere, is that Mika did score on a one-timer. The Rangers' only goal of the night it occurred on the power play. The Rangers fed it over to him, Gustafson making the pass, and Mika slamming home a one-timer. It's been a while since he's uh, scored on one of those, so it's nice to see it happen, and hopefully he gets rolling with that because we know he can get hot with that shot. So that's certainly a uh, silver lining as well. And also, you know, they, they end up with a too-many-men penalty early in the second period. This was right after that uh, Mika to Kreider misfire. So, you know, this all happens in the first four minutes of the second period, and this is the point in the game where you're looking for them to pick it up, turn it around, and get it going, and, and just kind of an ugly first couple of minutes uh, to the second period there. I did want to mention, though, and I, I talked about this in the intro very briefly as well, and I'm not making excuses for the Rangers. I'm just stating facts here. This is probably, I would say, looking at the schedule, you know, at the start of the season, and even as the season has progressed here, this to me seems like one of the hardest, most difficult, challenging uh, stretches of the schedule that the Rangers will have to go through. They had that weird thing where they had five straight days off, which is just bizarre. Um, and you don't want it to kill their hot streak, but they come back and then, then they have after five days off seven games in 12 days. And in order here, and most of these games have already been played. It was at devils at stars at penguins at flyers home against the Bruins home against the Sabres. And then on Wednesday, they'll be at home against the Red Wings. So some good teams there, uh, some rivalry games, some up and coming teams, 
Um, the first four of those were, of course, all on the road. They had that back-to-back with consecutive 1 p.m. start times, which is really weird. Uh, so I think it's fair to wonder, is the grind catching them, catching up to them a little bit? I think it's certainly possible. You know, they just didn't ha- seem to have that that extra jump in their game. They didn't seem to be sharp. And, um, you know, again, they're going through a tough part of their schedule. And I'm not making excuses for them. Uh, the good news here is that they've done fairly well uh, throughout the stretch here. Beat the Devils, lost to the Stars, beat the Penguins, beat the Flyers, beat the Bruins, and uh, lost to the Sabres. So uh, it'd be nice to see them close out this month with a win against the Red Wings. But the Red Wings, an improving team as well, should be a good game. And uh, obviously, we'll hope for a better result. And we'll hope that the Rangers certainly come out quite a bit sharper in that one uh, than they did here. Rangers will be at home against the Red Wings in the Garden on Wednesday at 7.30. They, of course, beat the Red Wings 5-3 to earlier this year after being up 5 nothing in that game. Got a little bit interesting, but obviously the Rangers uh, held on for the win. All right, so in just a second, going to keep everything rolling here. I want to talk a little bit about Patrick Kane signing with the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, also, a couple other highlights and or lowlights uh, from this game, including the disallowed goal by Blake Wheeler. I'm going to have some thoughts on that. Of course, it was... Uh, Ruled no goal due to a hand pass, so we'll discuss that and some other things as well. First, though, definitely want to let everybody know, today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices, show your total up front, so you know you're getting a great deal without all those annoying hidden fees. Buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWNNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, let's go ahead and uh, wrap up today. I want to talk a little bit about Patrick Kane signing with the Detroit Red Wings. The timing of this is obviously kind of uh, curious. I mean, it's just one of those things that kind of happens randomly, but of course, you know, people were talking about after Kako got hurt, if this is a long-term thing, uh, could Patrick Kane come in and blah, blah, blah. But um, he ends up signing with the Detroit Red, Red Wings less than 24 hours after that injury to Kako happened. And of course, what's interesting here, or part of what's interesting, is that the Rangers play the Red Wings. They host them on Wednesday night. And the rumor is that Kane could make his season debut on that evening in Madison Square Garden. We'll see if that actually happens, but that would certainly be uh, an interesting beginning to the Kane era in Detroit. But at this point, as far as Kane fighting at home, signing with someone other than the Rangers at this point, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of just, I'm kind of just relieved that it's over. You know, I, I've been really split on this. Um, obviously there are reasons to be interested in bringing Kane back. There's the fact that of course the Rangers are thin at right wing. It, it seems like it's still the biggest weakness on the team. And if Kako is going to be out long-term uh, then that's even more true. So there's that. There's also the fact that, I mean, look at his resume, three-time cup champion, um, all kinds of all-star games, slam dunk Hall of Famer, the whole nine yards. We know all about that. Um, On the other hand, something just didn't really seem to click between Kane and the Rangers last year. It's possible. Possible. I'm overanalyzing it. But anytime the Rangers have brought in kind of like a rental player at the deadline the last couple of seasons, whether it's, you know, Andrew Kopp or uh, Tyler Mott, Frank Vetrano, um, even like somebody like Nico Mikola last year, it feels like everybody just kind of fits in right away. And with Kane, I, I just didn't really see that. And again, it's possible. I'm overanalyzing it. Um, you know, obviously I'm not in the locker room. I, I don't see what goes on behind closed doors, but I don't know. Something just felt a little bit off. Something felt like it just didn't quite click. Um, and I haven't seen the terms of this contract as far as Kane signing with the Red Wings. You'd have to assume it's probably for only one year. Um, not sure how much he's going to get. We'll see. Um, and I'd also be curious to know, and maybe we'll find out in the next couple of days here, uh, how hard the Rangers went after Patrick Kane. Were they trying to get him back? Uh, did this come down to money? Did this come down to the Rangers just didn't want him? Did this come down to Kane wanting to go somewhere else? Uh, all very interesting questions. And I'm not sure if we'll ever know like the full story here. Like were the Rangers Kane's number one choice and they didn't want him back or the Rangers want him back. Kane didn't want to come back hard to say for sure. And, and we'll see if any details emerge on that in the next coming days. Um, but as for this game, you know, shifting our attention back to this game here, I did want to talk a little bit about the disallowed goal by Blake Wheeler. 
you know, at this point with all these reviews and everything, and, and granted this one wasn't actually a review, but I'm at the point where I just don't want any more controversial goals. I just want one Ranger game, whether they win or lose or whatever happens. I just want one Ranger game where there's nothing debatable. There are no shades of gray. Every goal that scored is a clear cut, you know, no doubt about it goal um, rather than, well, did he kick that in? Did it, um, you know, was the whistle blown? Did it go off of this guy's hand or did it go off of his elbow? And uh, that last scenario is basically describing what happened in this game. So to kind of set the stage, you had the Rangers on a power play and, you know, it got toward the end of the power play and they score Do the Rangers. You got the second unit on Kako, Lafreniere, Miller, Cooley, and Wheeler. The Rangers score at the very end of this power play or, or just after it ended. I'm not really sure which, but regardless, they weren't, they weren't credited with a goal. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but basically, as soon as the puck went in the net, or actually before it went into the net, it looked like uh, the refs had already blown the whistle. Now, in this case, there have been other times where they've said that, like, oh, the puck was frozen, when in reality, no whistle was blown. On this instance, you did hear the whistle being blown. But basically, the puck popped up into the air behind the Ranger net, and it made contact with Cooley somewhere in his upper body. And I don't know if it was his glove or his elbow. It's very difficult to tell. The puck then dropped basically right into the crease. Blake Wheeler's there, and he stuffs it home. And the Rangers thought they had scored. Um, unfortunately, that turned out to not be the case. The refs immediately waved it off, and then they told Peter Laviolette that he could not challenge it. And there was some conjecture, like, if it hits the elbow, does it still count as a hand pass? My understanding is that if it went off Cooley's elbow, um, then it should be a good goal. It's crazy just how how much we have to do of this. Like, like it really just blows my mind how much time I've spent trying to interpret rules and explain rules on here. But that's the way it's been going. You know, obviously there have been a lot of controversial goals and no goals uh, in Ranger games this year. But yeah, I don't know. If it hit his elbow, then to me it should have been a good goal. But my understanding is that once the whistle blew, it's a dead puck and it basically becomes not re reviewable. And Peter Laviolette basically said the same thing after the game. Uh, this we had to said about the situation when he was asked. Uh, if he was able to challenge that or why he didn't challenge it. This is what he said. They said the play was dead. That was the reason. I had a hard time telling what it was, whether it was a glove or elbow. Our guys saw a different view that said maybe glove first, then elbow. So I don't know. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Um, it wasn't the Rangers night. And honestly, um, you know, that one, it could have gone either way, but it was also kind of a night where the Rangers probably didn't earn any of the breaks. There was also a weird play late in this game where, uh, Lafreniere, everybody thought Lafreniere had scored in this instance, obviously though, it hit the side of the net and didn't go in. Um, but you know, the lamp went on, the light went on, the fans were cheering. Lafreniere thought it was a goal. It's kind of a weird situation there, uh, as well, but yeah, just not the Rangers night. And I, again, you guys know anybody, the everydayers, the people that listen to this every day, I'll acknowledge the fact that you're not going to eat two and oh, you're going to have nights like this. Uh, the Sabres got the jump on the Rangers and props to them for being able to do that. Rangers are still playing very, very well through what I think is maybe the most difficult stretch of the schedule this season. Um, so, you know, I I'm big on how the team responds. H how are they going to do now against Detroit after you know, something of a lackluster game in this one? Obviously, they found their game a little bit as it progressed. You know, the second period, third period felt like they might get the score tied. Just didn't happen. But regardless, I'm very curious to see now how they bounce back in D or uh, at home against Detroit, I should say, on Wednesday night. Definitely looking forward to that. Also, just wanted to mention that it was also Hockey Fights Cancer Night. And I just want to say that I think the Rangers, whether it's this or um, some of the other theme nights that they do throughout the entire season, I, I just think they always do such a fantastic job uh, with these perform or with these uh, you know ceremonies and um, all these events. You know, you'll have uh, people saying the national anthem that maybe were cancer survivors, and um, there were a couple instances in this game where you had I, this was a really good one. There was 14 year old. Rocco Pisani, uh, cancer survi survivor, excuse me. Uh, he got to ring the bell, which was attached to a hockey stick. He's a hockey and basketball player at his high school. And apparently his last chemo treatment was in August. And he would do Zoom calls with Adam Fox while he was going through all this. So just so cool to hear that, that Adam Fox, you know, would uh, volunteer his free time like that and stay in touch with this kid and, and tell him to keep his head up and keep going. Uh, just really cool stuff. You also had uh, Tom... Kerensky, I hope I'm saying that right. I, I believe that's how they said it on the broadcast last night. Uh, he had a full thyroidectomy and is now cancer-free. Apparently, he got to meet up with Adam Graves. He, too, uh, was able to ring the bell uh, during this game. And other people were honored throughout the entire night. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but obviously all those people are heroes and, and very brave and um, just, just so cool to see the Rangers um, 
you know, obviously uh, do right by them and, and give them their own night here. It's a great uh, theme night that the Rangers have. Everybody knows somebody who knows somebody at the very least, you know, that, that has fought this, this battle with cancer. It touches everybody. It doesn't discriminate. It's just a horrible disease. And I'm um, just nice to see the Rangers, you know, going to bat for people who either did fight cancer or are still fighting cancer, you know, whatever the case might be. And I also found this out too. Uh, Sabres coach Don Granado, actually a cancer survivor in his own right. I did not know that. So uh, kind of neat that he was in the building uh, on the same night that, you know, the Rangers were doing this. So um, yeah, pretty much call it there for today. Once again, Rangers going to be back in action against the Red Wings on Wednesday. Can't wait to see how they come out in that one. If you guys would like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that's at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I'll see you next time.